get there to the concert day and we're seated on the piano bench. And I heard this little, ha, 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 and I knew she was into something. She didn't bother to play all that she was supposed to play. She played it either very quickly or very slowly, which set the tempo for what I was doing. And, and I was running all over the piano keys. We somehow finished together. Park Ridge is a prosperous neighborhood, self-contained and insulated from the problems of the inner city just a few miles away. It made for a conservative upbringing. At Maine East High School, Hillary made her first forays into politics, standing for election as student leader and losing. Many times she was described as conceited, which I finally realized was two things. Generated by her was the fact that she had such poor eyesight that she very seldom recognized people from afar, even close up. So they took that as a brush off. But secondly, I think what we took as conceit in Hillary was always a, a sense of self-worth, a very confident young woman. How many rooms does the White House have? Does anybody have a guess? What do you think? 29? More than that. 50? More than that. 70? More than that. How many? 150? Less than that. 120? More than that. <laughs> Very close. We think there's 132 rooms. The model of self-confidence in her own school days was the man who ran for president in 1960, JFK. I'm asking each of you to be pioneers towards that new frontier. But Hillary was not among Jack Kennedy's pioneers. He was a liberal and a Democrat. The teenage Hillary, like her family and friends, was a staunch Republican. John F. Kennedy, whether it was the religious issue or the fact that he was a Democrat, was an anathema to the average person in Park Ridge. He was East Coast as opposed to Midwestern. He was everything that we weren't. You voted for Nixon. Four years later, undaunted by Nixon's defeat, she was again backing the Republican cause. The tide has been running against freedom. Our people have followed false prophets. The Democrat candidate was Lyndon Johnson. 17-year-old Hillary Rodham had a special reason to listen carefully to his words. You vote for peace and prosperity for yourself, according to the dictates of your own conscience. Lyndon Johnson and Hubert Humphrey will be mighty happy. As the national election gathered steam, American schools held their own debates. At Maine East, Hillary got the job of playing Lyndon Johnson. 36 years later on her own campaign trail, the memory was fresh. That's when I was a Goldwater Republican and I had a very um, thoughtful uh, government teacher who uh, said to me and to one of my very close friends then who was one of the few Democrats in my very Republican high school, uh, he said, I want both of you to learn about the other side. And Hillary, I'm assigning you to play President Johnson. And of course, I clutched my heart and said I couldn't go home and tell my father. Uh, and told my friend uh, that he wanted her to play Barry Goldwater. And you know, she went into hysteria. But it required us to go to the library, read things we never would have read before, and sort of marshal the arguments. And uh, as fate would have it, I became a Democrat, and she became a Republican. Who won the debate? <laughs> well, Linda Johnson won the election. <laughs> It was in the staid surroundings of Wellesley College outside Boston that the political rot set in. The nice Republican girl from Park Ridge was elected head of the student body. One job was to negotiate with Wellesley's president to bring the college rule book up to date. I don't think we ever hit it off terribly well. Um, Hillary was a reformer. She wanted to change things and when Hillary had a cause, she stuck with it, admirably in a way. I didn't always agree with causes, but I, I did admire the tenacity. Tenacious, yes, but still within the system. 
Certainly her politics tutor Alan Schechter never thought of her as a typical radical. There was plenty of opportunities for students at that point in time to take over classroom buildings, take over administrations, march on Washington, interfere with the defense establishment. Hillary never did any of these things. The tumultuous year of 1968 was like a frontier between her upbringing and her future. Martin Luther King was assassinated. So was Senator Bobby Kennedy. And the American involvement in the Vietnam War divided the country down the middle. Riots broke out that summer outside the Democratic Convention in Chicago close to Hillary's home. She was shocked by the police violence and sympathetic to the cause. But though she went to see for herself, she didn't take part. She called and she said, we have to go downtown and see what they're doing at, you know, the convention, the riots. And off we went. And here were kids, you know, with their heads bashed in. And they were all our age. It was very, you know, frightening. But we were definitely going to be spectators. We never really joined in. A few weeks later, Hillary returned to the calm of Wellesley for her final year. She had now crossed the frontier and was about to become a Democrat. Her graduation day in May 1969 was to give her her first taste of national limelight. She and the other leaders of her year were pressing the authorities to let a student speak at commencement, the graduation ceremony. Initially, we were rebuffed um, when we went to Ruth Adams, who was the president, and the other people who were involved on the college campus. And uh, even though we were told no in the beginning, we just kept pushing. Ruth Adams agreed to let Hillary speak, provided the students assured her the speech would be appropriate. We were giving her assurances. We were saying, of course, we're going to be responsible and constructive. We had the message loud and clear that um, uh, she did not want any trouble over the speech. She could say what she wanted, and she did. But it wasn't what you expected. No. <laughs> no. I was a bit slack to it, I must say. At first, there was no hint of trouble. Proud parents got out their cameras. Guest of honor was Massachusetts Senator Edward Brooke, the only black member of the Senate. The senator spoke, pretty traditional in his attitudes about what women's roles would be, and almost a warning to us to be good citizens in a, in a modest, quiet, appropriate role. And then Hillary arose, and you could see her shift her papers around, and you wondered what was up. She was so angry at what he had just said that instead of delivering her speech, which she had written out, she started talking about what he had said, and it was entirely ad hoc. She said something like this, I am compelled to comment on uh, uh, Senator Brooks' speech because it just raised sort of everything that is wrong about where American government is going. And this is what our leaders have been feeding us for years and years, and her generation wanted much more. Not exactly the responsible speech that her classmates had promised Ruth Adams. Hearts began to sink. I remember just waiting for the moment and hoping it would come soon, 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 where she veered out of this mode back into the speech, which we'd spent so much time working on, we thought was quite good. There's no recording of her outburst, but Hillary spoke of making the impossible possible and giving up the acquisitive, competitive society for a more immediate, ecstatic way of life. Hardly revolutionary, but her tone kept her audience on the edge of their seats. My own vision of the thing would have been to have a much less aggressive confrontation with someone who was technically an honored guest. You never can say Hillary lacks courage. 